section forty nine of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty five the gladstone administration ireland and egypt eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty five part one the general election of eighteen eighty turned largely upon questions of foreign policy Mr. Gladstone himself framed a wholesale indictment against what he described as the Beaconsfieldian system. The verdict of the country was in his favor, and it was inevitable that effect should be given to that verdict. It has been already shown how that was done in Afghanistan and South Africa. Lord Beaconsfield did not long survive his defeat. Amid the ruin and reversal of his policy, he passed away, on april nineteenth eighteen eighty one his death under circumstances almost tragic aroused a wave of deep feeling in the country the queen felt it as a personal bereavement and paid unique honour to his memory with her own hands she placed a wreath upon his coffin and erected in hewenden church a tablet bearing an inscription from her own pen footnote to the dear and honoured memory of benjamin earl of beaconsfield this memorial is placed by his grateful sovereign and friend victoria regina imperatrix kings love him that speaketh right End footnote. there was no shrewder judge of character than queen victoria and that she trusted lord beaconsfield is a high testimonial to his integrity and patriotism but to the majority of his countrymen he remains what throughout a long career he always was an enigma his enemies describe him as un-english his patriotism they declared was pinchbeck and his sense of honour distorted in home politics they believed him to be merely opportunist self-seeking and unprincipled much of the adverse criticism was due to early prejudice which he never quite lived down he was not born to the purple and for the greater part of his life he had to fight and fight hard for his own hand nevertheless inscrutable as he was some things are clear he was a man of unyielding courage of wonderful temper of intense concentration of purpose a bitter antagonist he had real magnanimity and never bore a grudge he was a skilful tactician conciliatory as a colleague and considerate as a chief can he be described as a patriot patriotism is difficult of definition but this at least may be said that no man since chatham had a higher sense of the honour and greatness of england as he understood those attributes than benjamin disraeli earl of beaconsfield apart from foreign policy the new government was soon launched upon a sea of troubles of the most turbulent ireland something will be said later but not even Ireland, perhaps, caused the cabinet and its chief more worry than what was known as the Bradlaugh case. Charles Bradlaugh, a notorious and outspoken atheist, was returned for Northampton at the general election. The parliamentary oath ran, I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Queen Victoria, her heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. Bradlaugh claimed, instead of taking this oath, to be allowed under the parliamentary oaths act of eighteen sixty six to make an affirmation a select committee decided that he was not entitled to do so he then offered to take the oath with its meaningless addendum in the usual form a second select committee decided that he could not do so the house then refused to allow him to affirm but under a new standing order he was subsequently allowed to affirm subject to statute july first the case was now transferred to the courts who decided against bradlaugh's right to affirm and vacated his seat promptly re-elected by northampton april eighteen eighty one he presented himself to take the oath and the house repeatedly refused him permission to do so in february eighteen eighty two he administered the oath to himself and was expelled from the house re-elected by his constituents he repeated the process the government proceeded against him for illegally taking the oath and the courts decided against bradlaugh he then applied for the chiltern hundreds 
stood again and was re-elected, 1884. He was again elected by Northampton at the general election of 1885, and Mr. Speaker Peel then declared that he knew of no right whatever to intervene between him and the form of legal and statutable obligation. Bradlaugh quietly took the oath and remained until his death, 1891, a highly respected member of the House. In 1888, an Affirmation Act was passed, and in 1891, all the resolutions against Bradlaugh were expunged from the journal. The case is important for several reasons. Like the case of Wilkes, it raised the question as to the relations between the House of Commons and a constituency, and also the relations between the House and the courts of law. In 1884, the court refused to interfere with the privilege of the House of Commons to control its own proceedings and its own members. The matter had a political as well as a constitutional significance. It gave a very bad start to the new Parliament and the new government. It led to the virtual supersession of Sir Stafford Northcott as leader of the opposition. It brought into existence a distinct group of young conservatists, a fourth party of four members, footnote, Churchill, Gorst, Balfour, and Drummond Wolf, end footnote, and into special prominence a new parliamentary personality, Lord Randolph Churchill. With the domestic legislation of this parliament we must deal summarily. The Burials Act, 1880, removed a grievance of nonconformists by permitting them to bury their dead in parish churchyards with religious forms selected by themselves or without any at all. The Ground Game Act, 1880, popularly known as the Hares and Rabbits Act, allowed tenant farmers to protect their crops from vermin and to share the sport of their landlords. The Agricultural Holdings Act, 1883, strengthened the Act of 1875 by making compensation for improvements compulsory instead of permissive. More important was the Employers' Liability Act of 1880, which gave the workman a legal right to compensation from his employer for injuries sustained in the course of his employment through negligent management. The Bankruptcy Act, passed by Mr. Chamberlain in 1883, was a bold assumption of responsibility on the part of a State Department. Its effect was to transfer the control over insolvent estates from the Court of Bankruptcy to the Board of Trade and its official receivers. Less successful was the Electric Lighting Act of 1882, passed by the same energetic administrator. The intention of the Act was to encourage municipal enterprise in the provision of electric light. The result was to place serious obstacles in the path of private enterprise and to keep Great Britain twenty years behind any other civilized country in regard to the commercial development of electricity. So disastrous was the Act that in 1888 Parliament thought it well to amend it and to give rather more encouragement to private enterprise. But a powerful obstructive weapon still remained in the hands of the municipalities. By obtaining a provisional order, they could block private competition and yet do nothing themselves. That gas-owning corporations should have sought to postpone the advent of a powerful competitor was natural. But this episode is an apt illustration of the evil that frequently arises from well-intentioned legislation. A useful act was passed in 1883 to diminish corrupt practices at elections and in 1884 the government reopened the whole question of parliamentary reform. During the previous decade, repeated attempts had been made notably by Sir George Trevelyan to assimilate the county franchise to that established in boroughs by the Act of 1867. From 1872 to 1879, an annual motion was defeated by considerable majorities. But in 1884, the government of which Trevelyan was now a member made themselves responsible for the bill. It passed through the House of Commons, but the Lords, on the motion of Lord Cairns, declined to assent to a fundamental change in the electoral body until they had before them the details of the promised scheme for the redistribution of seats. The action of the Lords aroused a violent agitation in the country, and bitter attacks were made upon the Second Chamber. 
their action had logic and reason behind it yet the country resented delay the case was eminently one for compromise but an impartial arbitrator was needed to bring the parties together rarely in modern politics has the crown played a more useful part than in making peace between the two parties and the two houses in the autumn of eighteen eighty four the queen was greatly impressed by the gravity of the situation and during the recess she laboured assiduously to bring the two sides together and not in vain mr gladstone met lord salisbury and sir stafford northcutt and discussed with them the details of the redistribution scheme satisfied on the main points the conservative leaders allowed the franchise bill to pass and in eighteen eighty five the redistribution act also became law by the former the county was assimilated to the borough franchise and some two million voters were added to the electoral register the latter went some way toward the principle of equal electoral areas all boroughs with less than fifteen thousand inhabitants were disfranchised and merged in the county districts boroughs with less than fifty thousand inhabitants were to lose one member for the rest with the exception of twenty-two towns which retained two members apiece and certain universities the whole country counties and boroughs alike was divided into single member constituencies in order to effect this twelve additional members were added to the house bringing up the total number to six hundred and seventy a profound change was thus accomplished virtually by consent that consent however was obtained by the mediation of the crown and mr gladstone had good reason to tender his grateful thanks to the queen for the wise gracious and steady influence on her majesty's part which had so powerfully contributed to bring about this accommodation and to avert a serious crisis of affairs the imminent danger of a collision between the two branches of the legislature was only one of the many anxieties which pressed upon the prime minister ever since the liberals had returned to power they had been harassed by difficulties in ireland lord beaconsfield had seen the cloud then no bigger than a man's hand nobody at the time believed that his warning was other than an election device his opponents discovered to their cost how accurate his diagnosis had been the post of difficulty was assigned to mr forster with lord cooper as his lord lieutenant they began their administration valiantly they declined to renew the peace preservation act and declared that they would try to govern ireland under the ordinary law within six months they discovered its insufficiency but sought their reluctant colleagues to call parliament together and obtain for them further powers in the meantime the government had passed an act for the relief of distress and had attempted to pass a compensation for disturbance bill more than one thousand evictions had taken place in the first six months of eighteen eighty lord hartington himself the heir to a great irish property declared that some landlords were taking advantage of the agricultural distress to clear their estates of poor tenants without expense to themselves the bill proposed that an evicted tenant should be entitled to compensation for disturbance if he could prove that he was unable to pay his rent owing to the bad harvests of the last three years that he was willing to continue his tenancy on just and reasonable terms and that these terms had been unreasonably refused by the landlord the bill was to remain in operation only until the close of the year but even so it had few friends in its ultimate form the parnellites declined to support it and though it was carried in the commons the lords rejected it by two hundred and eighty two to fifty two votes its rejection gave the signal if not the excuse for a terrible outbreak of lawlessness in ireland speaking at ennis in september parnell launched the boycotting campaign the man who took a farm from which the tenant had been evicted was to be put into a moral coventry to be isolated from his kind as if he was a leper of old the tale of agrarian outrages mounted higher and higher in october the government resolved to prosecute mr parnell mr bigger mr john dillon mr sexton and others for conspiracy to prevent the payment of rent but the jury as was foreseen disagreed 
Mr. Forster was convinced that further powers were necessary, but Mr. Gladstone, believing him to be a very impracticable man, was slow to agree. His colleagues, however, were against the Prime Minister, and he submitted. Parliament was summoned in the first week of 1881, and was at once asked to arm the Irish executive with further powers. The Protection of Life and Property Bill gave the Lord Lieutenant power to detain in prison without trial for a period not exceeding beyond September 30, 1882, any person reasonably suspected of treasonable practices or agrarian offences. The proposal was drastic, but not difficult to justify. In Ireland, said Forster, the Land League law is supreme, and there is a real reign of terror over the whole country. With painful and fatal precision, said Gladstone, the steps of crime dog the steps of the Land League. The leaders of that league in the House of Commons used every art to obstruct the progress of the bill. A sitting of 41 hours was ended by the courageous action of Mr. Speaker Brand, who on his own responsibility stopped the debate and put the question. Thus was the first reading carried. Thirty-six Irish members were suspended, and the powers of the Speaker in regard to the restriction of debate were enlarged. A second bill prohibiting the possession of arms or ammunition in a proclaimed district was also passed before the end of March. In April, Mr. Gladstone himself introduced a bill described by Lord Morley of Blackburn as giving the Irish peasant the charter of his liberation. As a fact, the bill ignored the best Irish opinion of the day and did nothing toward a permanent solution of the agrarian problem. It was based upon the principle of the three F's, free sale, fixity of tenure, and fair rent. It gave to sitting tenants increased security of tenure, the right of selling their interest in the holding to the highest bidder, and the privilege of having a fair rent fixed for a period of fifteen years by a judicial tribunal. There were also clauses which proved practically inoperative for facilitating land purchase and the multiplication of occupying owners. The bill was based, like the Act of 1870, on the assumption, denied by few genuine Irish landlords, that the Irish tenant possesses an interest in the soil quite unlike anything which could be equitably claimed by an English tenant. But it proceeded to recognize this right in the wrong way. It conferred a vast boon upon the sitting tenant at the expense not only of the landlord but of all future tenants. The consequence has been that the respective interests of landlord and tenant have varied not in concurrent but in inverse ratios. The lower the rent, the higher the value of the tenant right, until the one threatens to absorb the other, and the fee simple is virtually transferred to the sitting tenant. Had Mr. Gladstone condescended to listen to the best Irish opinion, or even to that of his own Irish law officers, the tenant right would have been fixed in the terms of the rent demanded or offered, and the worst results of the bill would have been avoided. It was, in fact, a fair weather act. It encountered storms of exceptional severity, and it foundered. The solution of the problem has been found not in the recognition of dual ownership, but in the creation of cultivating owners by means of state-aided purchase. The bill cost Mr. Gladstone one of his ablest colleagues, the Duke of Argyll, but despite the Duke's vigorous opposition, the House of Lords, with some modifications, accepted the bill, and it passed into law. It did nothing to improve the immediate situation in Ireland. The Parnellites spurned it, outrages multiplied, the jails were filled with suspects, on October 7th, Mr. Gladstone, much irritated by the reception accorded to his remedial legislation, declared that the resources of civilization were not exhausted, and on October 13th, Mr. Parnell was arrested and lodged in Kilmainham Jail. On October 18th, the League issued a manifesto commanding that no rent should be paid until the leaders were released, and two days later the League itself was proclaimed as an illegal and criminal association. Thus Forster waged his brave fight against the forces of lawlessness in Ireland. If I am arrested, Parnell had said, Captain Moonlight will take my place. He did. Forster, though in great personal danger, never faltered. When Parliament met in February, the Queen was able, with truth to say, 
that the condition of ireland showed signs of improvement and had forster been loyally supported he might have won through but his chief was already off on another tack with splendid courage mr forster had personally visited the most disturbed districts in ireland during the winter and had escaped unhurt on april nineteenth eighteen eighty two he left dublin to attend the cabinet which was to decide the future policy of the government but for the fact that he decided at the last moment to dine at kingston instead of in dublin forster would that night have been murdered by a band of assassins known as the invincibles on april twenty eighth the announcement of lord spencer's appointment as viceroy in place of earl cooper gave substance to rumours of a change in policy the rumours had some foundation in fact the cabinet learnt that if they would release parnell and other suspects the conspiracy which has been used to get up boycotting and outrages would now be used to put them down on may second the prime minister announced the release of all suspects not associated with the commission of crime and announced also the resignation of the chief secretary the Kilmainham treaty so called from the jail in which the irish leaders were at that time confined had been signed the prime minister had now flung the irish agents of the government over and made peace with the invincible agitator this is the account of parnell's brilliant biographer and this his summary of the terms the government were to introduce a satisfactory arrears bill and parnell was to slow down the agitation to such a treaty a man of forster's temper could be no party mr forster's successor was not as had been anticipated mr chamberlain the representative of the extreme left but lord frederick cavendish brother of lord hartington the leader of the whig section of the cabinet and himself an intimate friend of the prime minister on may fourth forster made a statement explanatory of his resignation in the middle of a scene already sufficiently dramatic parnell entered the house and confronted his old adversary and his new friends on may sixth the new viceroy made his state entry into dublin lord frederick cavendish arrived with him on the same evening the new chief secretary and mr burke the under secretary at the castle were stabbed to death by a gang of invincibles in phoenix park the murder of lord frederick was an accident the intended victim of the assassins was the faithful agent of the castle mr burke mr forster immediately offered to resume his post the offer was declined in january eighteen eighty three the invincibles were captured and brought to trial james carey one of the leaders in the plot and a member of the dublin town council turned queen's evidence five of his associates were hanged and three were sent to penal servitude for life carey himself was murdered on shipboard as he was flying to south africa and his murderer was hanged thus ended this terrible episode in irish history parnell expressed and probably with sincerity his detestation of the dastardly deed which had taken place it is in evidence that he was perhaps for the only time in his life completely unnerved in ireland there was genuine lamentation over the fate of the innocent stranger lord frederick cavendish profound sympathy for his courageous widow but little to spare for the devoted public servant who perished with him on the refusal of sir charles dilke to take the chief secretaryship without a seat in the cabinet it was accepted by mr george trevelyan who with lord spencer braced himself bravely for one of the most difficult tasks that ever confronted english statesmen a crimes act passed in eighteen eighty two gave the executive power in serious cases to substitute a commission of three judges for trial by jury to prohibit meetings and suppress newspapers to deport aliens to levy compensation on the districts for murders and maiming and to search for the apparatus of crime by night or day it also enlarged the summary jurisdiction of magistrates and in other ways increased the efficiency of the law but with coercion conciliation was to go hand in hand and the crimes act was accompanied by an arrears act which partly at the expense of the state and partly of the landlords relieved the tenants from a burden of debt and enabled them to go into the land courts to get a fair rent fixed under the act of eighteen eighty one thanks to the increased powers given to the executive by the crimes act 
the murderers of lord frederick cavendish and burke were brought to justice and the more serious kinds of agrarian crime were virtually stamped out the calm courageous and impartial administration of lord spencer and mr trevelyan gradually wore down their lawless opponents at westminster the obstructive tactics of the parnellites compelled the house of commons to spend an autumn session eighteen eighty two in revising its rules of procedure the most important of these gave authority to the speaker to close your debate in ireland mr parnell launched a new association to take the place of the suppressed land league to which he gave the name of the national league october seventeenth eighteen eighty two the avowed object of the new league was to secure home rule for ireland its methods were boycotting and intimidation but guided with superb skill by parnell it generally contrived to keep on the right side of the law its power was much increased by the inclusion of ireland in the franchise act of eighteen eighty four household suffrage gave parnell eighty five followers in the parliament elected in eighteen eighty five but we anticipate events apart from ireland and the other topics already touched public attention during the gladstone government was mainly concentrated upon egypt the course of this narrative has already disclosed the consistent reluctance of english statesmen to recognize the importance of egypt in the general scheme of english policy twice russia had offered it to england and at berlin bismarck not perhaps without sinister design pressed it upon lord beaconsfield to beaconsfield the offer must have been tempting for he was the first of english statesmen to perceive its significance but it was declined from his purchase of the canal shares a new era in our relations with egypt dates the sale of the shares was due to the increasing financial embarrassments of the khedive ishmael the debt which at his accession eighteen sixty three stood at three million two hundred ninety three thousand pounds had increased by eighteen seventy six to ninety four million pounds to this carnival of extravagance and oppression we may trace the european intervention in the affairs of egypt and thus the whole of the latest phase in its long history in eighteen seventy six mr stephen cave who had been sent out to make a report upon egyptian finance described the country as suffering from the ignorance dishonesty waste and extravagance of the east and at the same time from the vast expense caused by hasty and inconsiderate endeavours to adopt the civilization of the west no description could have been more apt the english and french creditors of the khedive naturally alarmed as to the security of their loans sent out mr goshen and mr joubert to look after their interests the immediate result was the establishment of the caisse de la dette may second eighteen seventy six this international commission was originally empowered only to receive the revenue set apart for the service of the debt and to sanction or veto fresh loans but its functions were rapidly enlarged to embrace the whole financial administration of the country lord derby refused to nominate an english commissioner but mr goshen devoid of lord derby's official responsibility suggested at the khedive's request the name of captain evelyn baring a member of the famous financial house and until recently private secretary to lord northbrook in india in this characteristic fashion there was introduced into egypt the man destined to be the regenerator of the country the great pharaoh of modern egypt in eighteen seventy nine ishmael's tyranny and extravagance had become insupportable and on june twenty sixth his suzerain the sultan was induced by the powers to procure his abdication his abdication writes lord cromer sounded the death knell of arbitrary personal rule in egypt but his son and successor tufik though honest and well-meaning was not the man to cope with the situation by which he was confronted the country and most particularly the army was seething with discontent of this discontent an obscure colonel named Arabi bey became the mouthpiece and representative it is not even now easy to determine the precise character and significance of the movement which Arabi led 
primarily a military revolt it was directed partly against turkish suzerainty partly against occidental intervention egypt for the egyptians was the battle cry of the rebels but how far either egypt or the egyptians would have been profited by their success it is difficult to say on september ninth eighteen eighty one the khedive found his palace surrounded by a large force under the command of araby and was compelled to assent to their demands he promised to dismiss two of his leading ministers to accept a responsible ministry to convoke an assembly of notables before the end of the year and to limit the functions of the kess to the service of the debt doctrinaire liberals particularly in england hailed with enthusiasm araby's success as portending an era of constitutional government for egypt most of those who had knowledge of the facts regarded it differently the democratic catchwords adopted by araby and his faction were in reality a thin veneer calculated to cover a movement of the regular oriental type europe became more and more uneasy order must be restored in egypt but how by turkey by the european concert by france and england conjointly or by either of these alone to any of these alternatives there was objection from one quarter or another in january eighteen eighty two england and france in a joint note assured tufik of their support and in may the combined fleet anchored in the roads of alexandria france then expressed a preference for a european conference the conference met in constantinople at the end of june and proved entirely abortive meanwhile an emeute at alexandria precipitated the crisis on june eleventh the arabs attacked the european population and slaughtered fifty or more of them mostly greeks in cold blood manifestly says lord cromer something had to be done for the whole framework of society in egypt was on the point of collapsing by june seventeenth fourteen thousand christians had left the country tufik was powerless to restrain the fanaticism aroused by araby now one of his responsible ministers the concert of europe was equally impotent great britain decided to act if necessary alone sir beechop seymour commanding the british fleet off alexandria was instructed to demand that the construction of fortifications should cease End of section forty nine section fifty of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty five the gladstone administration ireland and egypt eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty five part two the demand being ignored the admiral proceeded july eleventh to bombard and demolish the forts araby let loose the convicts and then with his troops abandoned the town which for two whole days was delivered up to fire pillage and massacre at length the british admiral landed a body of blue jackets and marines and order was tardily restored in the ruined city from the moment it became clear that decisive action was necessary france refused to cooperate and her fleet left alexandria for port said england had therefore to go through with the task alone the government moved july twenty fourth for a vote of credit for two million three hundred thousand pounds the first army reserves were called out on the twenty fifth and the first instalment of troops left portsmouth on the twenty seventh almost simultaneously troops were dispatched from india and among these the government following the precedent of lord beaconsfield decided to include a native contingent the command was entrusted to sir garnet wolseley who fulfilled his commission with extraordinary promptitude and skill debouching not from alexandria but from port said he landed in egypt on august nineteenth and marching on cairo across the desert he inflicted a crushing defeat on arabi storming the formidable lines of tel el kabir on september thirteenth so masterly were his strategy and tactics 
that the total British loss in killed was only fifty-four, and in wounded only three hundred and forty-two. On September 14th, Cairo surrendered to a couple of squadrons of British cavalry. The series of military operations, to adopt Mr. Gladstone's paraphrasis, was now complete. Araby was captured, brought to trial, sentenced to death, and finally deported to Salon. A British army was left in occupation of Egypt in order to complete the restoration of order, or in official phrase, the authority of the Khedive. When that task had been accomplished, the occupation would cease. That such was the genuine desire and intention of the government, there is no shadow of doubt. We shall not keep our troops in Egypt any longer than is necessary, but it would be an act of treachery to ourselves, to Egypt, and to Europe, if we withdrew them without having a certainty, or until there is reasonable expectation, of a stable, a permanent, and a beneficial government being established in Egypt. Thus spoke Lord Granville in the House of Lords, and his famous dispatch on January 3rd, 1883, announced that policy to the great powers. That dispatch further intimated that the position in which Her Majesty's government is placed towards His Highness, the Khedive, imposes upon them the duty of giving advice with the object of securing that the order of things to be established shall be of a satisfactory character and possess the elements of stability and progress. Giving advice is, as Lord Milner observes, a charming euphemism of the best Granvillian brand. But Lord Granville was at one with his colleagues in his anxiety that the function should be temporary. The anomaly of the whole position was strikingly illustrated by the events which shortly followed in the Egyptian Sudan. The Arabs of the South, as of the North, had long groaned beneath the burdens imposed upon them by their Egyptian taskmasters. Colonel Charles Gordon, who had acted as governor of the Sudan under Ishmael, retired in 1879, and from that moment the condition of its inhabitants was pitiful. Consequently, when Mohammed Ahmed announced himself as the Mahdi, or promised Messiah, the Sudanese rallied to his standard and drove the Egyptian troops into the fortresses. In September 1883, General Hicks was dispatched by the Khedive in command of a wholly inadequate Egyptian force to reconquer the Sudan. In November, Hicks Pasha, his European staff, and his Egyptian soldiers were cut to pieces by the Mahdi near Shekhan. Sir Evelyn Baring, who in September 1883 had returned to Egypt as consul general, advised the abandonment of the Sudan. Lord Dufferin, in his report of 1883, had advised that the western Sudan should be abandoned and that Egypt should be content to hold Khartoum and Senar. Lord Wolseley concurred in this opinion. After the Hicks disaster, however, Lord Wolseley urged upon Lord Hartington that a strong garrison should be established at Aswan, and that reinforcements should be sent to Suakin, Berber, and Khartoum. Lord Hartington agreed with him, and had their advice been accepted, one of the most disastrous episodes in English history might have been avoided. Sir Evelyn Baring and the British soldiers in Cairo were convinced, however, that Egypt could not without assistance hold Khartoum. The British cabinet were now face to face with a serious difficulty. The Sudan was no business of ours. Technically it was not. But British officers had been killed there. Egyptian soldiers were still blockaded there. And the Khedive, if he accepted our advice to evacuate, could not calmly leave them there to perish. At this critical moment, General Gordon was on the point of undertaking a mission for the King of the Belgians in the Congo. Asked what he would do in regard to the Sudan, he replied, I should send out myself. The distracted cabinet caught at the idea, and on January 18, 1884, General Gordon was sent out to Khartoum to report on the situation with a view to immediate evacuation. The Khedive appointed him governor-general of the Sudan. The home government acquiesced in the appointment, and in that capacity he started for Khartoum. Baring disapproved of the mission and still regrets it, but he agreed that if Gordon went out at all, 
it had better be as governor-general. That this appointment altered the character of the mission cannot be denied. Still less can it be denied that the imperial government approved the alteration. But ministers, especially Mr. Gladstone and Lord Granville, were already uneasy about it. Words, parliamentary words in particular, they could understand. Of decisive action they were afraid. Their hope now was that Gordon would himself decide upon the evacuation of Khartoum without explicit orders to that effect. Meanwhile, the facts of the situation were hardening. Gordon had hardly left Cairo for Khartoum when Colonel Valentine Baker, the head of the Egyptian gendarmerie, was badly defeated in an attempt to relieve Tokar near the Red Sea coast, February 4th. Gordon now found himself besieged by the modests in Khartoum. Lord Wolseley was quick to perceive the danger of the situation and urged upon the ministers the immediate dispatch of reinforcements to Suakin and the advance of an English brigade to Wadi Halfa. Failure to take prompt action at once might force us into a big war before many months elapsed. Sir Gerald Graham, dispatched to Suakin, inflicted some losses upon the Arabs and held that place securely, but nothing further was done. Baring became insistent that relief should be sent to Khartoum, and in England there was one person in high place whose clear brain penetrated through all the sophistries and ambiguities in which ministers, and especially their chief, delighted to involve themselves. On March 25, 1884, the Queen telegraphed to Lord Hartington, it is alarming. General Gordon is in danger. You are bound to try and save him. Surely Indian troops might go from Aden and could bear climate, though British cannot. You have incurred fearful responsibility. What the Queen said, the country thought. Lord Hartington was obviously uneasy, but Mr. Gladstone's mind was intent upon domestic affairs and parliamentary tactics and precious weeks and even months were allowed to pass before any decision was arrived at. The miserable troops on whom alone Gordon could rely were defeated outside Khartoum on March 16th, and it became clear that if ever Gordon was to leave Khartoum alive, he would have to be succored by his own countrymen. He himself had begun to realize that he was likely to be deserted. On April 7th, he telegraphed, you state your intention of not sending any relief up here or to Berber, and you refuse me Zobayir. Footnote. He had begged the government to appoint Zobayir Pasha, governor-general of the Sudan, but they demurred to the appointment of a slave dealer. End footnote. I shall hold out here as long as I can, and if I can suppress the rebellion, I shall do so. If I cannot, I shall retire to the equator, and leave you the indelibre disgrace of abandoning the garrisons of Sennar, Kassala, Berber, and Dongola, with the certainty that you will ultimately be forced to smash up the Mahdi under great difficulties if you would retain peace in Egypt. This telegram merely aroused Mr. Gladstone to the advisability of sending a set of carefully prepared questions to Gordon about his future conditions and plans. April 13th. Baring warned the government that they ought to begin immediate preparations for a relieving expedition in the autumn. April 14th. Lord Hartington confesses two days later that he had not the slightest idea what the government proposes to do. His ignorance was shared by all his colleagues, and the way was not made clearer by Gladstone's declaration, May 12th, that the reconquest of the Sudan would be a war of conquest against a people rightly struggling to be free. Berber, the halfway house between Suakin and Khartoum, was captured by the Mahdi, May 26th, an event which still further jeopardized Gordon's position in Khartoum. Nevertheless, Lord Hartington still failed to bring the cabinet to a decision. Their procrastination was due to no lack of pressure from the ablest of their military advisers, but despite the insistence of Lord Wolseley, nothing had been decided by the end of July. A threat of resignation from Lord Hartington and the Chancellor Lord Selborne, 
at last compelled the premier to divert his attention from parliamentary tactics and at the beginning of august gladstone asked the house of commons for the miserably inadequate sum of three hundred thousand pounds to enable the government to undertake operations for the relief of general gordon should they become necessary lord wolseley was then appointed to the command of the expedition he left england at the end of august and started from cairo to lead an expedition up the nile at the beginning of october gordon asked by the government why he did not leave khartoum replied i stay at khartoum because the arabs have shut us up and will not let us out lord wolseley made all the haste possible under circumstances of great difficulty but the procrastination of the cabinet had delayed the expedition until it was too late on reaching Corti, december twenty ninth lord wolseley dispatched sir herbert stuart with a small force by land to avoid the wide bend of the nile stuart after a hard fight at abu clay january seventeenth eighteen eighty five forced his way to the nile not far below khartoum but on january nineteenth was mortally wounded the command then devolved on sir charles wilson exactly a week later january twenty sixth the mahdi stormed khartoum and general gordon was killed wilson came in sight of the city two days after it had fallen the news of the tragedy reached london on february fifth and on receipt of it the queen dispatched an angry telegram to gladstone declaring that it was too fearful to consider that the fall of khartoum might have been prevented and many precious lives saved by earlier action to miss gordon she expressed in an autograph letter her grief and sympathy and her sense of the stain left upon england by general gordon's cruel though heroic fate the queen exactly expressed the feelings of her people the house of lords censured the government by one hundred and eighty nine to sixty eight and in the commons they were saved from similar condemnation only by a majority of fourteen their first resolution was to send out large reinforcements to lord wolseley to enable him to smash the mahdi at khartoum before the middle of april other councils prevailed the left wing of the radical party brought pressure to bear upon the prime minister who was more than ready to be convinced on april fifteenth the government decided to abandon the Sudan south of Wadi Halfa, and though retaining the port of Suakim, to abandon the construction already commenced of a railway from Suakim to Berber. This sudden volte-face was due only partly to parliamentary pressure. Serious danger was threatening in another quarter. On March 30th, Russia, quick to take advantage of England's preoccupation, had occupied Penjde on the frontier of afghanistan the danger in afghanistan passed and with its passing there was some disposition to modify the policy of complete evacuation of the sudan and to retain the province of dongola baring wolseley and kitchener were all strongly in favour of its retention and the queen pressed it on her ministers but the will of mr gladstone prevailed the british force was withdrawn in the summer of eighteen eighty five and for another twelve years the soudan was a prey to anarchy when the mahdi was poisoned in eighteen eighty five the khalifa whom he had nominated as his successor continued his tyranny meanwhile thanks to the long and patient labours of general grenville and general kitchener the egyptian army was completely reorganised and in 1896 the government of the Khedive determined to attempt the reconquest of the Sudan. This decision coincided with, and may have been precipitated by, the withdrawal of the Italians from Kassala. General Kitchener was appointed to the command of the Nile expedition, and slowly and patiently advanced toward the completion of his great design. Before the end of September 1896, kitchener was in possession of dongola abu hamed was taken in august eighteen ninety seven and at the atbara the dervishes were scattered april seventh eighteen ninety eight on september second the power of mahdiism was finally annihilated by the great victory of omdurman
Two days later, the British and Egyptian forces were paraded before the ruined palace of Khartoum and the shattered tomb of the Mahdi, and there on the spot where Gordon had perished, a funeral service was held in solemn memory of the dead hero and saint. The Queen conferred a peerage upon General Kitchener, and from Parliament he received thirty thousand pounds and formal thanks for the distinguished skill and ability with which he planned and conducted the campaign on the Nile, 1896-1898. to Never were honours and thanks better deserved. Hardly, however, had General Kitchener reached Khartoum when the diplomatic sky was suddenly overcast by a threatening cloud. The French government had never forgiven themselves for their withdrawal from Egypt at the critical moment in 1882, for more than a dozen years they had impeded in every way the work of financial and political reconstruction undertaken by Great Britain in Egypt, that task unwillingly assumed but patiently fulfilled seemed now to be on the point of final triumph and consummation. At the dramatic moment the French reappeared upon the scene. On July 12, 1898, Major Marchand, planted the French flag at Fashoda on the Upper Nile. For two years past, in the face of every difficulty, this intrepid soldier had been pushing his way from the French Congo across Central Africa. His arrival at Fashoda was well-timed, but General Kitchener, steaming up from Khartoum, denied his right to be there as the political representative of France. The victory of Omdurman was a potent argument, but Marchand refused to yield even to it. The quarrel was then referred to the diplomatists. Lord Salisbury claimed for the Khedive all the lands over which the Khalifa had borne away, and made it clear to the French government that the claim would be asserted by the whole force of Great Britain. In the autumn of 1898, the two nations were on the brink of war. France, however, gave way, recalled Marchand, and in March 1899, concluded with Great Britain a comprehensive agreement in regard to the Sudan. By this treaty, the rights of Great Britain over the whole Nile Basin from the source of that river to its mouth were acknowledged. France was confirmed in possession of a great West African empire, but the whole of the Egyptian Sudan was to be subject to the power which ruled at Cairo. Thus the way to the Cape was still open, unblocked by any other European power. From that moment, Anglo-French relations rapidly improved, and in 1904 the diplomacy of the Salisbury-Balfour government was crowned by the conclusion of the Anglo-French agreement, whereby France agreed to give Great Britain for thirty years a free hand in Egypt. Thus closed the chapter which had opened in 1882. British policy in the Sudan in 1885 was, as we have hinted, powerfully affected by the increasing tension of Anglo-Russian relations in Central Asia. In regard to Afghanistan, the Gladstone government had reverted in 1881 to the policy of the buffer state. Given the maintenance of friendly relations with a strong Amir, there was little cause for apprehension in the advance of Russia. In 1884, however, it became doubtful whether the buffer could be kept intact. Early in that year, Russia, conscious of England's preoccupation in the Sudan, occupied Merv and Sarox, and thus came within 200 miles of Herat. Such a step was in direct violation of Gorchakov's assurance given to Lord Granville in 1882 that Merv lay outside the sphere of Russian influence. Nevertheless, Lord Granville assented, somewhat tamely, to the proposal of the Russian government that a joint boundary commission should be appointed for the definitive delimitation of the frontier. Sir Peter Lumsden, the English commissioner, reached the Afghan frontier on November 19th. His Russian colleague, Monsieur Zelenoy, excused himself on the score of illness until February. February came, but no Zelenoy. The affront was unmistakable, and British patience was almost exhausted, the more so as the Russians usefully employed the interval by occupying various eligible points on the frontier. The situation could not endure. On March 6, 1885, the Queen addressed to the Tsar a personal appeal that he would assist her in maintaining the peace, but on the 29th, 
Russians and Afghans came into collision at Penjde, and the Russians in consequence occupied the place. The Afghans felt that their protector had deserted them. Fortunately, however, the Amir was at this moment at Rawalpindi, where Lord Dufferin had received him with splendid hospitality, and now smoothed his natural indignation with irresistible adroitness. At home the government acted with unusual decision and promptitude. The reserves had already, March 26th, been called out in England, and the news of the seizure of Penjde aroused public excitement to the highest pitch. We know, said Mr. Gladstone, that the attack was a Russian attack. We know that the Afghans suffered in life, in spirit, and in repute. We know that a blow was struck at the credit and authority of a sovereign, our protected ally, who had committed no offense. We must do our best to have right done in the matter. This speech, April 27th, was the prelude to a motion for a vote of credit of eleven million pounds, four million five hundred thousand of which were to be for the Sudan expedition. The vote was agreed to without a dissentient voice, a hint not lost upon Russia, who agreed to submit the questions in dispute to the arbitration of the King of Denmark. In the event, Penjde, for which Abdur Rahman cared little, was left in the hands of Russia, but in compensation the Amir secured the exclusive control of the Zofilar Pass, for which he cared much. There was general satisfaction that peace had been preserved, but there was an uneasy suspicion that it had been purchased at the price of a fresh humiliation for British diplomacy. That this impression contributed to the overthrow of the government is undeniable. All through the session they were hard-pressed by their opponents in Parliament, but their ultimate fall was due in even greater degree to their own internal weakness and dissensions. With the greatest difficulty had they kept together through the Sudan crisis in 1884, and between the middle of April and the middle of May 1885, no less than nine members of the cabinet intimated, on one point or another, an intention to resign. In the last months of their existence, the main cause of division in the ministry was not foreign policy but Ireland. The Crimes Act was to expire in August. Was it to be renewed? In whole or in part? The Whigs leaned toward partial renewal. The radical wing insisted that if any portion of the act were renewed, it must be accompanied by a reform of local government and perhaps by the establishment of a central administrative board in Dublin. Mr. Gladstone, whose supreme anxiety was to avert a rupture in the ministry and the party, was hopeful of an adjustment of differences, but nothing was actually settled and on June 8th, an amendment to the budget moved by Sir Michael Hicks' speech was carried against the government by 264 to 252. It was significant that 39 home rulers voted in the majority. Mr. Gladstone tendered his resignation to the Queen on the following day, June 9th. Several of his colleagues, notably Lord Hartington, were glad to be released from a task which had become increasingly distasteful, but the Queen demurred to the necessity of resignation. Lord Salisbury, summoned on the 11th, took the same view and pointed out the peculiarity of the circumstances. Two million new voters had been enfranchised by the Act of 1884, but the new register was not ready, and an immediate dissolution was therefore out of the question. Consequently, the Conservatives, if they took office, would not command a majority in the House of Commons, nor could they appeal to the country to give them one. If they were to come in, it must be on the understanding that the outgoing ministry would assist them to obtain the necessary supplies and carry on the routine business of state. Mr. Gladstone would give no pledge, and the situation became tense. The crisis lasted from June 11th to June 23rd, and was terminated only by the good offices of the Queen. No less than six times in one day, did her private secretary, Sir Henry Ponsonby, interview Mr. Gladstone. At last, an understanding was arrived at, and on the strength of it, Lord Salisbury took office. The revolt of the younger Tories against the leadership of Sir Stafford Northcote was rewarded by the latter's reluctant removal to the House of Lords, where, as Earl of Idsley, he served as First Lord of the Treasury. 
Lord Salisbury himself took the foreign office, an admirable arrangement, if there had been another premier. Sir Michael Hicksbeach led the House of Commons as Chancellor of the Exchequer until the leader of the Fourth Party was ready. Lord Randolph Churchill modestly contented himself for the moment with the India office. Mr. W. H. Smith went to the War Office, Lord George Hamilton to the Admiralty, and Sir Richard Cross returned to the Home Office. Sir Harding Gifford became Lord Halsbury and Lord Chancellor. Mr. Gibson, who in late years had done good service to the party on the platform, became Lord Chancellor for Ireland with a peerage, Lord Ashburn, and a seat in the Cabinet. But of all the appointments, perhaps the most significant was that of Lord Carnarvon to be Lord Lieutenant of Ireland with a seat in the Cabinet. Lord Carnarvon, a man of high integrity and great independence, made no secret of his leanings towards some form of extended local government for Ireland, and his appointment went far to secure the Irish vote for his party at the general election. This took place according to arrangement in November. The English boroughs in the main returned Conservatives, but the new electors in the counties proved their gratitude to Mr. Gladstone by giving the Liberal Party a majority of 86. This figure exactly equaled the number of Mr. Parnell's followers. The strength of the Home Rule Party was the deciding factor in the situation. Before Parliament was opened, the Conservatives shed their Lord Lieutenant, and in the first critical division on the address, January 26th, 1886, the Parnellites threw in their lot with the opposition and left the ministry in a minority of 79. Of the majority, 74 were Parnellites. Lord Salisbury immediately resigned, and Mr. Gladstone was asked to form a government. Lord Hartington declined to serve in it, and his example was followed by many of the most distinguished of his former colleagues. The old Liberal Party was rent in twain a new issue of paramount importance was definitely raised, an issue destined to divide English parties for at least a quarter of a century to come. That issue is not yet decided. The chapter of history opened by Mr. Gladstone in 1886 is not yet concluded. At this point, therefore, it is fitting that this detailed narrative should stop. In more than one sense, the year 1885-1886 marks the parting of the ways the reform movement temporarily arrested by the French Revolution but breaking forth after the peace of 1815 with irresistible force had now for the time being clearly reached its term. By successive stages the great mass of the manhood of the nation had been admitted to the responsibilities of citizenship. To the arbitrament of the new democracy a great issue was presented in 1886. They were invited to confer upon Ireland a separate legislature with an executive responsible thereto. The proposal seemed to them to be fraught with danger to the Commonwealth, and they installed, and for twenty years with one short interval, maintained in power, the party which was pledged to preserve the integrity of the United Kingdom. Not, however, until the close of that period, 1905, did the recently enfranchised voters realize the potency of the weapon placed in their hands. By that time, the new ruling class had learned more lessons than were dreamt of in the educational philosophy of Robert Lowe. Before the vast issues, social and economic, which gradually emerged as the century faded, even that of legislative independence for Ireland seemed to pale into insignificance. These problems belong to the future. The historian is concerned with the past. Truthful narration may be required of him, but not speculation. If the dead must bury the dead, the unborn must struggle in the womb of time. End of section 50. Section 51 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 26. Epilogue, 1885 to 1901. Democracy and Empire. Close of the Victorian Era, Part 1. The formal argument of this work reaches its logical conclusion in the Parliamentary Reform Acts of 1884 and 1885 
nevertheless in order to sketch the progress of events down to the close of the victorian era some words may be added by way of epilogue to a period already regarded as old-fashioned the usage can hardly be deemed inappropriate for nearly ten years ireland continued to occupy the first place in political interest on coming into office in eighteen eighty five the conservatives deliberately declined to renew the expiring crimes act this decision was admittedly a grave one and it did not stand alone combined with a virulent attack by lord randolph churchill upon lord spencer's administration it gave substance to the prevalent rumours that the tory government meant to come to terms with parnell a promised re-inquiry into a notorious murder case and the passing of an act to facilitate land purchase seemed to afford further confirmation the land act of eighteen eighty five popularly known as the ashbourne act was one of the least pretentious but as far as it went one of the most effective agrarian measures ever enacted for ireland by a simple use of state credit it made a real beginning with the work of converting tenant cultivators into proprietors of the soil a tenant desiring to purchase his holding and agreeing with his landlord to do so could borrow from the state the whole sum required at four per cent by this means not only was his rent immediately reduced but at the end of a period of forty-nine years he became automatically the owner of his farm the total sum to be advanced by the state was limited to five million pounds but this modest experiment formed the basis of all subsequent land purchase legislation down to the great measure of nineteen o three nothing could have been more consonant with the best conservative tradition than the ashbourne act can the same be said of the communications which in the autumn of eighteen eighty five took place between mr parnell and lord carnarvon that the new lord lieutenant favoured the principle of federalism was well known he had already applied it to canada and had attempted to apply it to south africa would he venture to recommend to his colleagues its application to ireland the happenings of eighteen eighty five though in the highest degree momentous are still wrapped in some obscurity but this much is certain within a few weeks of taking office lord carnarvon met parnell and listened sympathetically to the statement of his views the fact of these meetings was communicated to the prime minister but not to the cabinet in november the irish vote in english constituencies was given under orders from parnell to the tory candidates the result precisely fulfilled the astute anticipation of the irish leader in the new parliament he held the balance between parties had the tories won a dozen more seats he could have kept them in power as it was he could reduce the liberals to impotence no sooner was the verdict of the electorate given than mr gladstone sent up his famous kite it is now clear that during the autumn of eighteen eighty five if not before his own mind had been tending in the direction of home rule but until the elections were over he gave no clear sign to him parnell's victory in ireland appeared decisive and franchised ireland had now spoken but he would gladly have seen the question settled by the conservatives and he actually opened the matter to the premier's nephew mr balfour lord salisbury however was not prepared for the plunge as soon as he was assured of this mr gladstone turned him out the new parliament met on january twelfth eighteen eighty six before it was many days old the lord lieutenant of ireland and his chief secretary sir w hart dyke resigned and mr w h smith succeeded the latter with a seat in the cabinet on january twenty sixth notice was given that the new chief secretary would promptly introduce a fresh coercion bill for ireland and on the same night the salisbury government found itself in a minority of seventy nine the immediate occasion was an amendment to the address regretting that no announcement had been made as to the provision of allotments and small holdings Footnote. This was Mr. Jesse Collings' famous Three Acres and a Cow Amendment. End footnote. But though the talk was of English labourers, the mind of the House was intent upon Ireland. 
Lord Salisbury treated the vote as decisive, and Mr. Gladstone for the third time became Prime Minister. But he was no longer the leader of a united Liberal Party. Lord Hartington, Lord Selborne, Lord Northbrook, Mr. Goshen and Mr. Bright were notable absentees from the new Cabinet, Sir Henry James refused the Woolsack, and Mr. Chamberlain and Sir George Trevelyan accepted office under protest and resigned before the Home Rule Bill was introduced. In the task to which he now devoted himself, Gladstone found his right-hand man in Mr. John Morley, a brilliant man of letters of advanced radical views, who had lately entered the House of Commons, and who now entered the Cabinet as Chief Secretary to the Lord Lieutenant. Other staunch adherents of the new policy were Lord Spencer, whose support was invaluable, and Mr. Childers, Home Secretary, whose conversion had preceded that of his chief. Mr. Gladstone introduced the first Home Rule Bill on April 8, 1886. There was to be a legislative body in Dublin to deal with Irish affairs in strict subordination to the Imperial Parliament. In the legislature there were to be two orders, one consisting of 28 representative peers of Ireland and 75 members elected by select constituencies, the other consisting of 206 members elected by the existing constituencies. The two orders were to sit together, though either might demand a separate vote and thus exercise a suspensive veto upon the other. The Irish legislature was forbidden to make laws relating to the Crown, the Army, Navy, or Defences, treaties, peace or war, trade and navigation, coinage, customs, excise, and many other matters nor was it to establish or endow any particular church. Irish members were no longer to sit in the imperial parliament. As to the executive, the Lord Lieutenant was to be converted into a constitutional ruler assisted by a privy council, but acting ordinarily on the advice of ministers responsible to the local legislature. This executive was ultimately to control the police and to appoint the judges. Into the complicated financial proposals it is unnecessary to enter, except to recall the fact that alongside the Home Rule Bill was a land bill, giving to the Irish landlords the option of selling their estates normally at twenty years' purchase of the net rental. That the terms of this latter bill affected prejudicially the fortunes of the former is hardly open to doubt. Apart from this, however, Mr. Gladstone was leading a forlorn hope. Against him was arrayed not only the regular opposition in unbroken unity, but the flower of the Liberal Party in Parliament, and outside it almost the whole aristocracy of intellect, of hereditary rank, and of commerce. In the House of Commons, Lord Hartington led the opposition to the bill, and powerfully supported by Mr. Chamberlain, defeated it on second reading by a majority of thirty. In that majority were no fewer than ninety-three Liberals. Mr. Gladstone immediately decided upon an appeal to the constituencies, and their verdict was conclusive. The Gladstonian Liberals returned less than 200 strong. Parnell had 85 followers. The Unionists numbered close on 400. Mr. Gladstone resigned office before the meeting of the new Parliament. The old Liberal Party was irretrievably shattered, and for 20 years, with one brief and unimportant interlude, the Unionists retained both office and power. With characteristic modesty, Lord Salisbury desired that the first place in the new ministry should be taken by Lord Hartington. But the Liberal Unionists, while promising unofficial support, were not yet prepared for fusion with the Conservatives, and the new cabinet was drawn entirely from the latter party. Tardy and transient amends were made to Lord Idsley, who became Foreign Secretary. Lord Randolph Churchill led the House of Commons as Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Sir Michael Hicks Beach loyally accepted the Chief Secretaryship to the Lord Lieutenant. The task before him was no easy one. Twice within the last twelve months had the enfranchised Celts of Ireland declared with virtual unanimity in favour of Home Rule. Their cause had now been espoused with enthusiasm by the most conspicuous statesman of the day. For a moment it had seemed not impossible that his genius and vigor might prevail. 
once again as in the days of lord fitzwilliam their hopes had been raised only to be dashed to the ground how were the unionists going to tackle the situation lord salisbury had recently declared that what ireland needed was twenty years of consistently strong and resolute government the restoration of social order was therefore the first plank of the unionist platform sir redvers buller a distinguished soldier was sent into the west of ireland to suppress outrages and crimes whereupon mr parnell produced in his tenants relief bill an alternative prescription in ireland as in england there was genuine distress among agriculturists but whereas in england the landlords behaved with extraordinary consideration toward their tenants in ireland there were some landlords who were disposed to press their legal rights to the uttermost parnell therefore proposed that rents fixed before eighteen eighty five should be reduced by the land court that leaseholders should be brought under the act of eighteen eighty one and that no tenant should be evicted who paid up his arrears and half his rent the bill was rejected by a majority of nearly one hundred prompt came the response from ireland in the plan of campaign this new strategical device was invented by mr dillon and mr william o'brien and was frowned upon by their leader the device was simplicity itself the tenants of any given estate were to agree on a fair rent should their offer be declined the money was to be paid into a war chest and spent on organized resistance to evictions the plan was inaugurated in the autumn of eighteen eighty six and throughout eighteen eighty seven the campaign was vigorously sustained it was a direct challenge to the elementary principles of law and no government worthy of the name could have refused to take it up consequently the first business of the new session eighteen eighty seven was a bill to amend the criminal law in ireland before this bill was introduced the personnel of the ministry had already undergone considerable modification on the eve of christmas eighteen eighty six the world was startled by the announcement that lord salisbury's principal lieutenant had resigned lord randolph churchill's ministerial career had scarcely begun by a few months tenure of the india office he had established a reputation as a first-rate administrator a few weeks leadership of the house of commons had convinced friends and foes alike that he would take rank among the great parliamentarians of the victorian era he had earned the warm approbation of the sovereign and in the party his supremacy was unquestioned well might he regard himself as not only omnipotent but indispensable some of his opinions may have sat lightly upon him in regard to national economy he had genuine convictions he believed with mr gladstone that so far from being incompatible with efficiency economy is the complement and test of it he was determined moreover to enforce his views upon his colleagues neither mr w h smith at the war office nor lord george hamilton at the admiralty would abate materially their demands the prime minister supported them and lord randolph resigned that he expected to be recalled on his own terms can hardly be doubted but he had made one grave miscalculation he afterwards confessed to have forgotten goshen lord salisbury's first impulse was to renew to lord hartington the generous offer declined in july the latter adhered to his decision but was willing that mr goshen who had held no office since eighteen seventy four should enter the conservative government mr goshen therefore succeeded lord randolph at the exchequer and proved a tower of strength to the party with which he was henceforth associated mr w h smith resigned the war office to mr edward stanhope and himself became first lord of the treasury and leader of the house of commons these changes involved others lord idsley with characteristic unselfishness had placed his seat in the cabinet at the premier's disposal in order to facilitate negotiations with the liberal unionists it was however from the newspapers that he first learnt that his offer had been accepted and that lord salisbury had himself taken over the foreign office january fourth eighteen eighty seven he declined the presidency of the council and on january twelfth the country was shocked to learn that he had died suddenly 
in the ante-room of the premier's official residence at ten downing street thus closed amid circumstances almost tragic a life of high utility and complete blamelessness three months later sir m hicks beach was compelled by temporary ill health to resign the irish office in which he was succeeded by mr a j balfour it was mr balfour who defined and carried through the unionist policy in ireland a man of high courage perfect temper and winning personality he was admirably qualified for his difficult task neither lawlessness in ireland nor abuse at westminster disturbed his serenity or deflected his course of action having armed himself with a new and effective weapon he pursued the policy marked out for him without haste without acerbity and with unfaltering consistency the new weapon was the criminal law amendment act ireland of eighteen eighty seven this act differed from previous coercion acts in that its provisions were permanent the lord lieutenant was authorized to declare an association to be unlawful and to proclaim a district as disturbed the powers of the resident magistrates balfour's removables as they were nicknamed were greatly enlarged in particular they were empowered to try summarily cases of conspiracy the passing of this crimes act was much facilitated on the one hand by the new rules of procedure adroitly carried through the house by mr smith on the other by the publication in the times of a series of articles on parnellism and crime the object of the articles was to establish the complicity of the nationalist leaders in recent agrarian crime on april eighteenth eighteen eighty seven the date appointed for the second reading of the crimes bill the times printed what was purported to be a letter from mr parnell to an anonymous correspondent apologizing for having had to denounce the murder of mr burke in phoenix park this famous letter was subsequently proved to be a forgery but at the moment parnell's denial of its authenticity was not believed and the publication served its immediate purpose coercion however was not to stand alone a land act eighteen eighty seven gave power to the court to revise the rents judicially fixed and admitted leaseholders to the benefits of the act of eighteen eighty one lawlessness probably reached its acme in eighteen eighty seven balfour and his crimes act were defied by the nationalist leaders but in july eighteen counties were proclaimed under the act in august the national league was proclaimed as an unlawful association in september an affray at michaelstown resulted in the loss of several lives and before the close of the year mr william o'brien and several other members of parliament and mr t d sullivan lord mayor of dublin were convicted under the crimes act and imprisoned it was a struggle a outrance between the forces of order and disorder but the law thanks to the steady persistence of mr balfour slowly but surely won meanwhile much discussion was taking place in the house of commons as to what action if any should be taken to sift the allegations of the times against parnell and his colleagues mr parnell asked for a select committee which the government refused to grant in its stead they eventually appointed a special commission to investigate the charges three distinguished judges sir james hannan sir john day and sir a l smith consented to serve and on september seventeenth the commission was opened it was in effect if not in form a state trial of high significance the attorney-general was the principal counsel for the times sir charles russell afterwards lord russell of cologne and lord chief justice of england for the defendants the commission sat for one hundred and twenty-eight days and examined more than four hundred and fifty witnesses only at one moment during this protracted period was the dramatic interest really tense that was when towards the end of february an old and broken man was put into the witness box and subjected to a scathing cross-examination by sir charles russell the man was richard piggott a needy journalist and now revealed to the world as the forger of the famous letter after enduring torture in the witness box for two days the miserable man fled the country leaving a full confession behind him 
before the police could execute a warrant for his arrest he shot himself in madrid march first the times offered an apology and withdrew the forged documents with this withdrawal much of the popular interest in the case evaporated but by no means all its significance on february thirteenth eighteen ninety the commissioners presented their report they found of course that the facsimile letter was a forgery and they acquitted mr parnell and his colleagues of the charge of insincerity in their denunciation of the phoenix park murders they found that the respondents collectively were not members of a conspiracy having for its object the absolute independence of ireland but that some of them had established the land league with the intention by its means to bring about the absolute independence of ireland and that they had conspired by means of an agrarian agitation to impoverish and expel from the country the irish landlords who were styled the english garrison that they had incited to the intimidation that produced crime and had promoted the defence of agrarian crime what was to be done with the report the government moved that the house thank the commissioners for their just and impartial conduct adopt the report and enter it upon the journals mr gladstone on the contrary tried to persuade the house to record its reprobation of the false charges of the gravest and most odious description based on calumny and on forgery that had been brought against members of the house it was clear that the terms of gladstone's amendment were an exculpation far beyond the findings of the commission it was rejected by a substantial majority and the government had its way no impartial person could interpret the findings of the commission as a general acquittal for the parnellites nevertheless it was inevitable that the revelation of the carelessness and blunders of the times and the exposure of pigott's forgery should have caused some revulsion of popular feeling mr gladstone and his party were immensely elated by the issue and the unionists correspondingly chagrined but the elation was short-lived mr parnell had entered an action for libel against the times in eighteen eighty eight in february eighteen ninety the case was compromised by the payment of five thousand dollars damages before the compromise was reached parnell was already involved in litigation of another kind on november seventeenth eighteen ninety captain o'shea obtained a decree nisi against his wife with parnell as co-respondent parnell affected to believe that the divorce suit was a matter of merely personal interest the organs of nonconformity sounded another note and mr gladstone quickly re-echoed it on november twenty fourth he expressed the view that parnell's continuance in the leadership would be productive of consequences disastrous in the highest degree to the cause of ireland but on the twenty fifth the irish party ignorant of mr gladstone's letter re-elected parnell as sessional chairman of the party mr gladstone immediately published his letter and the thundercloud burst for some weeks the utmost confusion prevailed in the home rule camp mr dillon and mr o'brien then in the united states called upon parnell to resign mr healy vehemently urged the same conclusion upon his colleague in committee room number fifteen the roman catholic bishops issued a pronouncement of similar purport but parnell held grimly on he would neither abdicate nor submit to deposition at length december sixth a majority of his colleagues forty-four in number withdrew their allegiance and elected mr justin mccarthy as their leader twenty-six remained faithful to the old chief for nine months parnell made frantic efforts to maintain his position in ireland his pluck was superb but all the cards were against him and on october sixth eighteen ninety one the painful struggle was terminated by his premature death thus was removed from the political stage one of the greatest personalities of the century on the list of irish patriots mr gladstone placed him with or next to daniel o'connell deeming him to be of more muscular and stronger character than grattan that he loved ireland is certain whether his love for ireland was as intense as his hatred of england is doubtful 
Parnell's death overshadowed another event of some parliamentary significance. On the very same day that Parnell died, under circumstances almost tragic at Brighton, there passed away, full of years and honour, Mr. W. H. Smith, the leader of the House of Commons. Succeeding to the leadership at a critical moment, Mr. Smith had done yeoman service to his party. Disarmingly simple, transparently honest, invariably courteous, he retained the respect of his opponents and won the affection of his friends. By universal acclaim, the brilliant chief secretary was called to fill the vacant place. Mr. Balfour had accomplished the task to which he had set his hand in Ireland. He had shown himself sympathetic toward undeserved suffering, quick to devise healing remedies, but above all inflexibly firm in the vindication of law. He had greatly extended the operation of the Ashbourne Act, and had set up a commission for dealing with congested districts. He proposed in 1892 to crown his work by a large measure of local government, but the scheme was coldly received, and early in June it was abandoned. A few weeks later, Parliament was dissolved. The general election which ensued grievously disappointed the hopes of Mr. Gladstone. Instead of the majority of at least 100 on which he had confidently counted, the country gave him one of 40, and that highly precarious in composition. England was still staunchly Unionist, but was overborne by the Celtic fringe. In the new Parliament, the Unionists numbered 315, the Gladstonian Liberals 269, and the Irish Home Rulers 81. In view of the composite majority opposed to him, Lord Salisbury decided to meet Parliament, but on an amendment to the address, he was beaten by a majority of 40, and in August he gave way to Mr. Gladstone. The Cabinet of 1892 differed little in personnel from that of 1886, but was reinforced by Mr. H. H. Asquith, a young Oxonian who had quickly established a reputation at the Bar and in Parliament, and now became Home Secretary, by Mr. Bryce, a great jurist, by Mr. H. H. Fowler, a shrewd provincial solicitor who did admirable work at the local government board, and others. The new ministry at once, September 1892, suspended by proclamation the operation of the Crimes Act in Ireland, and thus cleared the decks for the great measure of 1893. The second edition of Home Rule was disclosed to the House by the Prime Minister on February 13, 1893. In several important particulars, it differed from the first. The single-chamber device with its two orders was dropped, and the bicameral system was frankly adopted. The Legislative Council of 48 members was to be elected for eight years by persons who owned or occupied land of the rateable value of £20 per annum. The Legislative Assembly was to consist of 103 members elected by the existing constituencies except Trinity College. Should the two chambers disagree, the question was to be decided, but only after the lapse of two years, in joint session by a majority. In the original draft, Irish members to the number of 80 were to be retained at Westminster, but not to vote on questions affecting Great Britain exclusively. This in-and-out clause was subsequently dropped, and the Irish members were retained for all purposes. The bill, after prolonged discussion, was pushed through the House of Commons, by the amazing energy of Mr. Gladstone, but in the Lords it was thrown out by 419 to 41, September 8th. An immediate appeal to the country might have given Mr. Gladstone the mandate he wanted to deal with the House of Lords, or it might not. Denied the opportunity of bringing the matter to an issue, Mr. Gladstone decided that his part in the great drama was played. Weighed down by increasing infirmity of sight and hearing, and sincerely desiring a quiet interval between the turmoil of politics and the grave, he resigned office in 1894. The interval he had craved lasted for four years. He emerged from his retirement to plead the cause of the Armenian Christians in 1896, but on May 19, 1898, after some months of suffering, he passed away. Noble tributes were paid to his memory in both Houses of Parliament, his body lay in state in Westminster Hall and was afterwards buried in the Abbey. One of the ablest of his lieutenants has since painted his portrait in colours which will never fade. 
for a final appreciation of a statesman who played so large a part in contemporary affairs who excited in unusual measure alike admiration and detestation the time has not yet perhaps arrived but this much may be said though lacking the simplicity and directness characteristic of bright he was a consummate orator endowed by nature with a commanding presence and a sonorous voice he acquired by art an extraordinary command of language and uncommon felicity of illustration as a debater he was not equal to disraeli lacking his imperturbable temper and his sense of humour and although he could rouse intense enthusiasm among his followers he cannot be said like peel to have played on the house like an old fiddle great as an orator he was still greater as a man marvellous in the versatility of his interests and touching life on many sides a genuine scholar of the old oxford school and a devoted son of the anglican church as a statesman his greatest strength lay in finance he had been admirably trained in the school of peel and he was throughout his career a jealous guardian of the public purse perhaps he spent too much of his ministerial life at the treasury undoubtedly he spent too much of his public life in the house of commons consequently his statesmanship was of the strictly parliamentary type his gaze was too closely concentrated upon tactics sometimes as in eighteen eighty four eighteen eighty five with disastrous results to say that his outlook was insular would be untrue no man had a more vivid sympathy with oppressed nationalities or a more touching faith in the universal efficacy of parliamentary institutions but although he was frequently aroused to vehement speech by tales of oppression and occasionally to prompt action as for example by the bad faith of russia in regard to the penjade incident yet his interest in external affairs was intermittent and his temper in such matters only was apt to be procrastinating nevertheless no one could look upon him without a sense that here was a man cast in a heroic mould and that whether he was right on a given question or wrong in nothing was he less than great after mr gladstone's resignation the queen selected lord rosebury as his successor and for fifteen months he carried on the government sir william harcourt succeeded to the leadership of the house of commons and the interest of the session of eighteen ninety four centred on his budget the queen's speech of eighteen ninety five contained a portentous list of measures including welsh disestablishment licensing reform and the abolition of plural voting but no part of this ambitious programme was brought to legislative fruition on june twenty first the government was beaten on a war office boat and promptly resigned the queen again sent for lord salisbury who for the third time became prime minister no longer however was he at the head of a purely conservative administration things had moved fast since eighteen eighty six when lord hartington had twice declined the generous offer of lord salisbury he and mr chamberlain now agreed that the time had come for an even closer alliance between the two wings of the unionist party early in eighteen eighty seven an attempt had been made by a round table conference to find a basis of compromise on irish government between mr chamberlain and the liberal home rulers but the attempt proved abortive and was not renewed on the other hand the working alliance between the conservatives and the liberal unionists had now been maintained for nearly ten years to mr gladstone's second attempt to carry home rule in eighteen ninety three the latter had offered uncompromising opposition on succeeding to the premiership lord rosebury had made the significant admission that before home rule was conceded england as the predominant member of the partnership of the three kingdoms will have to be convinced of its justice but the schism in the old liberal party was now too deep for healing and unless the liberal unionist leaders were to renounce forever the hope of official service there remained to them no alternative but coalition with the conservatives one of those leaders conceived himself to be charged with a political mission far transcending the claims of party he was quick also to discern the signs of the times the centre of political interest was shifting rapidly from the centre to the circumference the strong administration of mr balfour the repeated failure of mr gladstone 
the agrarian revolution now in quiet process of accomplishment, all these things seemed to promise an abatement in the acuteness of the Irish controversy. The majority given to Mr. Gladstone in 1892 was not only small but precarious. The predominant partner remained wholly unconvinced. The mind of the nation was turning in another direction. On the formation of the new ministry, some surprise was felt when Mr. Chamberlain selected the colonial office. It was, in fact, an unmistakable indication that he was conscious of the trend of opinion. Lord Hartington, who had now succeeded to the Dukedom of Devonshire, became president of the council. Lord Lansdowne, another liberal unionist, accepted the war office. Mr. Goshen, the admiralty, and Mr. Henry James took a peerage and the chancellorship of the duchy. Such appointments not only brought an immense accession of strength to Lord Salisbury's ministry, but marked a notable stage in the evolution of a new political party. Of this evolution the country evidently approved. The new ministry wound up the business of the session with all possible speed, saved a few useful measures from the liberal wreck, and in July made their appeal to the constituencies. The electorate was asked to confirm the verdict pronounced by the House of Lords upon the second edition of Home Rule. The reply was unequivocal. In the new Parliament, Unionists numbered 411, Liberals 177, and Nationalists of both sections 82. The country had made up its mind on Home Rule and wanted to hear no more of it. For a decade its wishes were respected. In 1898 through 1899, the government carried two measures of first-rate importance. The Local Government Act of 1898 applied to Ireland. The local principle, which was already revolutionizing local administration on this side of the channel, that this act opened out a great vista of useful and patriotic work to Irishmen of all parties cannot be questioned. The second measure was of even greater significance. In form, it only established a Department of Agriculture and other industries and technical instruction in Ireland. In effect, it initiated a social and economic revolution. Worked in close connection with the Local Government Act of 1898, and interpreted and administered with rare wisdom and devotion by Sir Horace Plunkett, it has verily laid the foundations of a new Ireland, and has taught some lessons which Great Britain has yet to learn. With the enactment of legislation so full of happy augury for the future, the historian of the nineteenth century may be well content to close an important section of his work. End of section 51